Hi, this is Marlene, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Stories of the Supernatural. Whether you're watching a video or listening to a podcast, please like and subscribe to us so that you can get notification of when a new show is released. Links to videos or MP3 files can be found on MiamiGhostChronicles.com. Go to MarlenePardo.com for information on new book releases. I narrate several podcast series that can be found on major podcast platforms and can also be listened to via Alexa, Sonos, and other home systems. Look for Supernatural Storytime for scary storytelling, Nightshade Diary for classic horror and adventure stories, Stories of the Supernatural for interviews with different guests on the show. If you want to get noteworthy news about the paranormal world, true crime, conspiracy stories, and anything that is just plain weird, you can visit Strange Than Fiction Stories tab at MiamiGhostChronicles.com or find us on Blogspot. I want to thank you for being part of my audience, and I think you are all wonderful. Hi, everybody. This is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicles, Stories of the Supernatural. How's everybody doing today? Good, I hope. I'm good. Um, still in uh, <laughs> moving to a new place recovery mode, but um, but it's good. It's going good. Again, for those of you who follow this, yes, I have no decorations because I still haven't gotten around to it. And I want to state what I state. It's lucky that the camera can't <laughs> can't see the boxes that I still have in my office. So yeah, I'm I'm still, believe it or not, unpacking stuff. And over here, um, it's going to be cold. It's, even though I moved to Northern Florida, it can get very cold up here. And it was 80 degree weather and now it's cold today. And, and for those of you who have been watching the show for a while, you know what a wimp I am about the cold weather. But anyway, let's get on to the good part. Okay, uh, this is a guest I've never had on here before, but it we're going to talk about a very, very fascinating subject I know a lot of you have asked me about. And the name of the guest is Craig Campobasso. Now, fresh out of high school, uh, first of all, he's a California native and fresh out of high school, he found himself working behind the scenes for four years on Frank Herbert's Dune, um, the father and daughter producing team of Dino and Raffaella De Laurentiis and director David Lynch were his mentors in the business of filmmaking. And then he apprenticed as a casting associate of Steven Spielberg's Amazing Stories. Uh, Rafaela later hired him to be a casting director for the popular Christmas movie Prancer, starring Sam Elliott. And uh, I'm Emmy-nominated for casting David E. Kelly's Picket Fences. Craig has been casting for more than three decades and is an acting coach in the Los Angeles area. His passion is to write stories that provoke the reader to think, to raise their consciousness, to expand their mind about creation while still entertaining in the Hollywood tradition. He uh, has directed, written, and produced the short film Stranger at the Pentagon, which was adapted from the popular UFO book authored by the late Dr. Frank E. Strange, Stranges, or Stranges, I'm not sure on the pronunciation on that. Uh, after production, the short film collected accolades, and in September of 2014, it won Best Sci-Fi Film at the Burbank International Film Festival selling out all 700, I'm sorry, 275 seats, a first for the festival. And then in 2015, it won a Remy Award at the World Fest Houston International Film Festival for Best Sci-Fi Short. And boy, do I like my sci-fi stories. Uh, Craig has appeared on many radio shows, including Coast to Coast AM with George Norrie. He's also been a guest on the Open Minds talk show with Regina Meredith in two episodes of Beyond Belief, hosted by George Nora. Also on Gaia.com, or Gaia, some pronounce it. He's also appeared on the History Channel's Ancient Aliens, where Giorgio A. Tusakulos is the main ancient astronaut theorist. You know, the guy with the crazy hair. I love him. Yeah. <laughs> Personalized and autographed copies of Craig's four book sci fi series, which you're going to see some of the covers on some of the uh, slides that I have, guys. Uh, titled The Autobiography and an Extraterrestrial Saga. Believe me. This show's going to be fascinating. And I'm going to have a link in the credits of the show, but at towards the end, we're also going to repeat it. It's at uh, autobiographyofanet.com slash forward forward slash books. 
you know, like I said, we'll have a link and we're going to talk about it again for the podcast listeners. And it's also available on Amazon and audiobooks. So how are you doing today, Craig? I'm good. How are you, you doing? <laughs> and, and, and just so you know, the website is autobiography of on a n e t. Everyone says Annette. <laughs> You know what? I looked at that and it was when I read it, it was like, that's exactly what it says. Okay, maybe. Yeah, that's right. It looks like it looks like okay, a I'm, I'm glad I'm not the only one that was like, hmm. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So I'm going to ask you what I ask all my guests. Yeah. Which is, this is such, I mean, obviously your background from what I saw in your bi- biography was Hollywood. Right. And, but it, and then you were here into extraterrestrials. How did you, was it one thing having to do with the other? Did you have a personal experience as a child or as an adult? How did you end well, up here? When, when I was 26 years old, I had a major, major spiritual awakening. And mm-hmm. I only thought, yeah, at the time, uh, it lasted for two years, which was just incredible. And then back, and then in 2014, I had a second one. And, and what I realize is each time that you have one, I didn't know you could have a second one. So I assume okay. if you can have a second one, you can have a third one and a fourth one mm-hmm. if you choose to keep elevating your spiritual sustenance, right? Yes. But uh, back back when I initially had it in um, when I was 26, I... Uh, what what happened was is I had some universal master teachers mm-hmm. that started coming to me in the dream states, and then I would start going to them in the astral state, okay. and then after a, a period of four months of that going on, then I would be in the dream with them. I would wake up in that in that other realm with them, know that I was there with them. And then I would wake up in my bed and I would see them standing in their astral bodies uh, below my bed. And uh, at a certain point, they, they fed me this golden light, which Mm -hmm. permeated my entire being and went into all my cells and woke me up, like woke me cosmically up. Mm -hmm. And for about eight months, I had this incredible uh, thing that everything I saw was, I couldn't believe how beautiful everything was. And I was feeling the way that the creator must have created it for our enjoyment, right? And for our love and how everything was created from this love. And um, and as you know, uh, I'm a casting director. My office mm-hmm. was on Sunset Boulevard at the time. So when I would see actors during the day, I could read their soul history and see how beautiful their journey had been. And I would have to excuse myself and go into another room and I would just sob and sob and sob these beautiful tears. And nobody so, knew what was going on, though. They were thinking Nobody what? knew. Nobody <laughs> knew. Only me um, and a few of my close friends. But. Uh, this lasted for eight months, and then I had some more waking processes. And uh, and over the course of two years, um, one of the uh, master teachers actually said to me, uh, "Oh, and during the course of these two years, I I wrote a journal book, which I was intending on trying to get published. Right? It was like 400 pages of this journey that I had just taken." And, and mind you, I shared it with all my friends. I would have giant parties at my house and I would share the information. I would get ufologists to come to my house and talk to people and, uh, all of that sort of stuff. So, so my experience was a very happy one and, and nothing about ridicule or anything Mm -hmm. like that, you know, and if so, just very minor. But, um, so, uh, at the end of these two years, uh, one of the master teachers said, what would you say if I told you you just wrote that book for yourself? And I said, then I really learned a lot about myself. 
And he said, now it's time to sit down and write the books that you are supposed to write. And I want you to sit down and I want you to write and write and write and write and write until you can write no more. I don't want you to stop. I don't want you to edit anything. Back then, I'm 26. I don't even know what channeling is. I don't okay. know what any of that is. I'm just doing. So the so these this is where the autobiography of an extraterrestrial saga books came from, okay. which is basically allowing everyone on Earth to see how the universe is run up there. So it would be the Star Trek of the universe. Okay. where we're the star track of earth going out there this would be it coming to earth and it also coincides with um the consciousness raising programs that are going on on earth through the university of melchizedek and um and through its lead character whose name is Tehran. that's why the first okay. book is called i am Tehran. he's a pleiadian he's seven foot seven and he uh, is a professor at the University of Melchizedek, and he actually teaches the star seeds that are going to embark on their new journey of incarnating into Earth, quickening their spiritual uh, stuff because they're already fully conscious. But right. when their soul incarnates here, as we know, then um, then they 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 have a a, a very quick spiritual quickening and okay. and this is how consciousness is raised so anyway the uh, uh so that was how it all began for me and I, I just got uh so fascinated with um uh everything that had to do with this so i really immersed myself in the ufo community and i saw um i went on a lot of cases i um, just when I read every book I could get my hands on, and, and this has been a 35 year ongoing study since then. And, uh, what, and was there, a, a, I'm sorry, when you like you were a young guy in the in yeah. your 20s, yeah, did you have like a triggering event? You know, how you hear these people have accidents, they hit their head, and they become psychic. Was there something in your life or something that happened to you physically? No. That caused you? It was just you blossomed and you had these nope. experiences. They had just happened. Did you it at any just... point like think, wonder, am I is it you know, am I going crazy? Did or were you no, from the not very at moment? all. Not at all. Because when it first began, I I just thought, wow, these beings are really loving and beautiful. Mm -hmm. And when I would wake up, I would think about them for a little bit. And okay. then they would go out of my mind and then it would happen again the following night. And, the, and that the process repeated. And after a certain point in, in the second section in the, in mm -hmm. the uh, third and fourth month, I'm literally saying, Oh my God, I am now waking up in their realm. I need to look at this. Okay. I don't understand it. I never feared it. I never went into any, um, type of, uh, you know, analysis of, you know, am I crazy? Am I this? Am I that? Right. Um, I will say that when the only challenging part was when I really started to break out of duality and start mm -hmm. venturing in towards being fully consciousness, full, you okay. know, full consciousness, it, the my belief system had a period of about three days where it really mm -hmm. struggled and i was and i knew that i had to work past that okay to get to the place that i needed to be because really what this process was was clearing the vessel for the writing okay Okay. Right. That's what this whole two year process was. So and it continues to this day. So there's four when books. When you receive this series. message that basically you're talking about different races of extraterrestrials, it's not besides the fact of an extraterrestrial. Actually, we're talking from what I've seen more than one. Because well, there's is, it, what did it, what, didn't you like for a moment go, wow.
you know, this is incredible. No. Um, no. Well, I went, this is incredible. Yes. <laughs> I, I mean, that was for sure. But I did, it was kind of strange. It's almost when I look back at it, I uh -huh. think it was something that they also did to help my psyche to process it okay. where I wouldn't um, uh, analyze it too much to okay. ruin the actual experience. So I began to remember things that happened to me when I was a child at this oh, point. Oh, okay. And, and one memory was I was around 10 years old. I was sitting in the bathtub and I was just sort of sitting up and I was looking into the nozzle and my whole energy went into this focus beam like okay. I had never experienced. My entire soul was pulled out of my body. I went to the middle of the universe. It opened up. I went in it. I saw it. I felt this incredible love. And at 10 years old, I started saying, who am I? Where did I come from? Uh, all the questions we asked ourselves much okay. later in life, right. I was put back and I remembered coming out of that and I never thought about it again. I never even discussed it with my parents. Really? So I know that I was supposed to have these things because uh, what I found in a lot of all the research I have done with um, uh, abductees and contactees is that mm -hmm. when they're young, they have experiences so that later on in life, when, when they have their main contacts, is that they will no longer fear it. They won't fear it. It'll be an easier transition. So these things need to be done uh, when they're young. So, and I, and I find that that happens in most cases. So. Do you think then that you were, you had experiences in childhood that you just didn't remember? Well, I did, I did. But then once, once I be, started waking, I started remembering. You started remembering them. Okay. Yes. Yes. And then I, and then I just realized why they were shielded and that kind of thing, because mm -hmm. I had a normal childhood, right? right? I did. I always felt, I always felt that I was never from here. Mm -hmm. Always felt that way. Okay. But I felt very connected to my mother. All right. Right. I mean, I, I have a great family. I had a great mom and dad, two great sisters. And, um, uh, but, but my mom especially. So, um, I, you know, and that's just a, that's a soul history. So, okay. so that was a, you know, that was a very, I had a very good upbringing, a very loving family. I mean, I hear just horror stories from lots of people's upbringings and, and yeah. things of that nature, but, but mine was really blessed. How long, how many books did they, um, I guess I want to say, how did they dictate this to you? Was did you go into a I dream just heard thing? it. I, I would hear it. Okay. And then if it, if it was in a specific place, uh -huh. I would see the visual in my mind's eye. Oh, yeah. Sometimes I would astral travel okay. to the actual world, or I would go there and I would see the beings. Or if it was a temple, I would get to go to the temple and see what it looked like so that when I would write about it, I could describe it in great detail. So that's when I decided that I had to find some little extra jobs so I could hire an artist. Okay. And so all of these books are fully illustrated uh, of the, with the, um, uh, the galactic kingdom, the angelic core, uh, the paradise sons, the um, uh, uh, worlds, uh, landscapes of some of the worlds inside the ships, inside the, you know, the different craft and all of those types of things, because they were, you know, they explained everything in great, great detail. So, so each book has about 80 to 90 color, not color, wow. but um, 
pieces of artwork in it so so that people can understand that. And I, I guess I'm going to ask you, what do they want with us? Well, primarily, the, um, th- these are... And, and, and the reason why I ask is that, you know, there's two, there's two schools of thought. There's the one that they're friendly. There's another one right. that are... They they're not that friendly. Well, that that's true. Both both of that those are true, right? Okay. But but the ones that are here to help us far outnumber the ones that are here to harm us. That's so, a good thing. Yeah, it's a very good thing, and we are very much watched after um, mm-hmm. by the angelic kingdom, the celestials. Um, uh, and the whole galactic kingdom. So, uh, so through this starseed program that I was telling you about earlier is the consciousness is already tipped in the direction that, uh, that we are going fully conscious as a world global consciousness. So everything that is happening now and all of the disarray, everything has to sort of get a little messed up before mm-hmm. things can come together. We have to learn our lessons. They're not going to do it for us. They're not going to change it for us. But the one thing that they can do is they can send assistance in through star seeds and through crystal kids and indigo Mm -hmm. kids. And oh my God, I've met some of these kids. Some of these kids speak five star languages and they're they're like 10, 11, 12 years old. It's just in them. Uh, They draw star maps. that kind of thing. So with each, uh, every time a star seed comes in and raises their consciousness and they find, if they find a mate that matches them, then that soul coming in uh, will be a star seed coming in through them because their spiritual elevation is so high that a, a, a stronger soul can come in. And then that soul becomes strong and so on and so on and so on until it finally we start having fully conscious beings walking on the planet. Now, there are real full, fully conscious extraterrestrials that are living on the planet as well okay. through that has been talked about through a lot of the contactees around mm-hmm. the globe uh, who are having these experiences. And I've, I uh, mentioned them and talked to them about in the in the new book, this one, the extra. Right. Yes, I, I, I was looking at that. that is... Right. So, so there's there's just uh, I mean there there's so much in it. You know, for all of you who are newbies here, <laughs> you know, listening mm-hmm. to all this information, it is a lot to take in, but just. Take it in with an open mind and just work on yourself spiritually because that's the only way we're going to get rid of all of the negative riffraff on the planet. And Craig, because have they been among us as a lot of people a, a lot, have suggested yeah. since ancient times? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing okay. is, is once a planet is in this full consciousness, negative mm-hmm. beings can no longer stay here. They can't. They cannot bear to be in that vibration. Okay. Right. Or they will have to, or their soul mirror will come up and they will have to take a look at themselves and start to work on themselves to go forward. But they don't want to do that. Do you think we're ever going to get, it makes you wonder, are we ever going to get disclosure from the authorities or are they, one of these days is something going to happen where it's like, hey, this cannot be, hidden anymore. We well, have to- I, I think that day will come. I don't know if we're going to get like full disclosure from the government, but if right. you sort of look at it from their point of view, mm-hmm. they've been covering up since uh, the forties. Um, yeah. They covered up the, the big um, uh, one, one of uh, in the stranger at the Pentagon uh, story. Uh, okay. by Dr. And Strange's uh, Dr. Frank met Valiant Thor in December of 1959. Um, uh, that website, by the way, for people is strangeratthePentagon.com. And okay. um, 
that way they can learn more about Valiant Thor and uh, his picture is actually on the uh, website um, okay. as well. So, but he came here with a divine design um, in 1957 and was put on VIP status and lived at the Pentagon. And during these three years, it would be discussed amongst the government, the Joint Chiefs, other powers that be, about implementing this design to eliminate poverty, sickness, how to prolong life, to talk to them about atomics, the dangers of it, not only for our world, but for all worlds and for interdimensionals as well and about free energy and how we were polluting the planet and mm-hmm. all of those things. So in a nutshell, they um, they turned it down. Eisenhower and Vice President Nixon were for it, but it was all of the rest of the Joint Chiefs and things. They just wanted his organic technology pretty much okay. long during those three years. So, so um, but... Um, so I, uh, uh, I met Dr. Frank in 2001 and, uh, just through a course of circumstance, I ended up writing the screenplay, uh, to his book and, uh, sitting with him for, you know, every week for the rest of his life. He died in 2008. And so I just shelved it. And then in around 2012, I decided to make a short film to raise the, uh, to use that as a promotion piece to investors. I never mm-hmm. intended to show it, but the world wanted to see it so bad. I mean, I was just getting things from everywhere. So I released it. Uh, people can watch it on the website or if they have Amazon Prime, they can watch it on Amazon Prime. Okay. Uh, it is a short film and we're setting up the feature film now. So, um, if there's any millionaires out there, call me. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case. <laughs> call me. <laughs> follow, follow that link in the credits. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So uh, anyway, so you want to talk a little bit about the extraterrestrial species? Right. Almanac? Because like I said, you, you know, it's always gone between, um, you know, like that uh, Twilight Zone, the, the cookbook. You know? the cookbook. Oh my God, was that? <laughs> We're an here to serve the humans. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Either was that, that or yeah, um, yeah. Uh, well, or ET, well, you know, very friendly. And then there's others that are like, yeah, we're gonna, yeah. you know. We're going to get the short end of the stick in this because they're superior in technology to us. And well, know. the interestingly enough, the uh, some of the dark ones have superior technology. They have superior mind control abilities. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, we call it telepathic hypnosis that they okay. can do on humans as okay. well. Um, and they are very, very advanced but they are wired for aggression domination um all of these kinds these kinds of things but they also know how to circumvent universal law okay and how they circumvent universal law is like coming to earth for instance they'll go to a leader and okay. say, if you let us do this on the planet and set up underground bases, we'll give you this amount of technology that will advance your, your part, your country, and give you superiority over the rest of the world, right? So that's how they circumvent it, because if they agree, there is nothing that the galactics can do, but to watch them and hope for an infraction. Okay. So in other words, there's a set of laws out there that they abide by. Yes, exactly. Exactly. All of those laws, by the way, are all in the universe, in the um, extra, uh, in the the autobiography of an extraterrestrial saga. In the back, there is a whole terminology of the extraterrestrial world. So I suggest to people, Mm -hmm. to read that in the back of the book before you read the book. Um, And if you're an avid reader, 
uh, on the homepage of the website, autobiography of on anet.com. Uh, on the right hand side, you can order all four books and soft cover by clicking a button, or all four okay. books and hard cover by clicking a button, or you can order them individually as well. And then this, this book is on the same website, but you click in the upper tab, other books. Okay. And and then that's where that is. So what I do is I personalize and I sign oh, them for really everyone. Cool. Yeah, I love doing that. Look, I I've been wanting to be a writer my whole life. My mom told me when you from the time you were in my tummy, I know you came here to be a writer, and she would always tell told me that. Even though I wanted to venture off into other things before mm -hmm. I started writing, yeah, she always supported me in whatever I did. You know, so. But she knew that about you. Yeah, she did. Yeah, she just she was just incredible. So let me um, ask you what what and, and I find this fascinating because the, the what you said about that some of these ones the uh, the aggressive or uh, not so nice ones they let's say they approach uh, like you said uh, somebody in power, <clears throat> right? Is it? And I'm trying to think, is it that these people or these leaders or these people in power are already aware that extraterrestrials exist? Oh, or God. How do they how do they have that conversation without this person powerful or not wigging out and going, huh? Or is well, it that they're they, already aware? They connections. They've already got connections to okay. these other extraterrestrials. Now, a lot of the races, by the way, over the years have approached mm -hmm. the government of the of the benevolent extraterrestrials okay. and our governments told them to go away all over the world they told really? them to go away because they know what they wanted and, and really all they wanted was their technology or they wanted mm -hmm. this and they know they they were never going to get it from them so that's why you see that over the years the extraterrestrials in their craft go over um, nuclear warheads and yes. things like that and they turn everything off mm -hmm. and they say we want you to see what we can do because we are not going to let you blow this planet up exactly yes I've, right? I've heard frequently a lot of people especially the military personnel that work at these bases yes. have a lot of interesting stories oh yeah uh, a lot of them disclose once they're not there anymore, of course, because they do, they do. And a lot of them uh, will go and tell their story to somebody like Dr. Stephen Greer and it'll be all put on camera. And then when they pass away, then Mr. Right. Greer will release uh, what they, what they've said, because then they can no longer take away their pension or harm them. And or, I tell people, people don't realize, I say, you know what, for every person that's come out from the ex military or whatever that, yeah. you know, that you said that goes forward and says, look, I saw this, I witnessed this. There's a bunch of them that, di that don't ever come forward for the very reason you just stated their pension. They even may, they might even think of their yeah. families and they're like, they just decide I'm just going to be quiet about this. Yeah. And a lot of them have, and, or mm -hmm. they pass it along down their children. Um, yes. Like Jesse Marcel, uh, pass it down to his kids, you know, his mm -hmm. son, Jesse and uh, his other children who are now bringing all the, the true Roswell things forward. Right. And uh, all of that nature. So right. um, really, I will just say, just so for all your listeners to know, it is really out there on the internet if you dig deep and you start looking at a lot of the ufologists and all of the things that they have unearthed and mm -hmm. have talked about you will really really learn a lot right i right. mean a lot because um and some of it might sound like science fictiony to you um but i have met with uh, very big powers that be mm -hmm. and they have talked to me about being fully conscious and they and they say the weirder a story sounds it More means less. that it's true and that there's something weirder than that right right so um it's like it's like when we discover all the weird sea creatures at the bottom of the ocean that like we in the Mariana seen. Trench. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was just watching a, a thing the other night on that. I was like, Oh my God, look at that. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, you just couldn't believe that all these things were, you know, just exist formulated and, and exist and are created. So, yeah. And there's a, yeah. A, still a lot that's unexplored. Let me yes. ask you the, the, the extraterrestrials that I'm going to say the nice ones. Yeah. Do they hold back on the technology that they have because they just don't think we're ready for it or they're right. going to allow that's us right. to discover it on our own? As soon as we're fully conscious, they will mm -hmm. share everything. They okay. share as a as a galactic kingdom. They share everything because this is their belief. In the beginning, when there was a primordial atom, that mm -hmm. atom held all of creation within it. And when it when it grew and expanded, if you want to look at it like that. Mm -hmm. We are all a part of that. We are all one and the same. Okay. We are all just going to school on different planets. Mm -hmm. Here we're learning duality, right? right? When we graduate off this planet, we might go back to Melchizedek and figure out where we want to go okay. next. And then maybe we want to learn uh some kind of scientific knowledge and we might go to a planet that specializes in that and then if that planet is a fully conscious planet then we're going to take okay. on a lifetime that is going to be thousands and thousands of years long right and then that really starts getting into you know we start thinking of other things uh, of all the things that I that I explored in the autobiography of an extraterrestrial saga is all right are you going to have one mate for thousands and thousands of years? <laughs> <laughs> so it'll be interesting for people to understand how all of the society is set up. And it's, do they, and I don't know if they've ever explained that, do they travel as in, you know, what we consider space travel light years, or are they interdimensional? Is that how they travel? Well, they're there uh, when when it depends on it depends on the soul's involvement and what planet they're on and what dimension okay. they're in because that's so. If you've graduated to the sixth dimension, that's mm -hmm. as far as you can go. But you can go back and interact with the others, right? Okay. So. Um, then you get, you know, we we're here in the physical realm when we finished with the physical realm mm -hmm. then we go and we live in the, if we want to call it the, um, uh, ethereal or astral realm, right? Mm -hmm. Where every, where, where we go when we pass away and then, mm -hmm. and then we've got, oh crap, I got to go back to earth. <laughs> I didn't learn oh, that or, here go. or whatever. Right. And then, um, and then when we graduate from that realm, then we go into the celestial realm where we really become true creators. Okay. Right. Do so, and there's various levels within each. So in other words, you could realm. be a human, and then, in other words, that be gone, be doing. You're gonna, you're gonna be everything. <laughs> okay. You're gonna be everything on this planet. You are going to be black, white. Latino, mm -hmm. every race, every creed, every religion, you are going to understand it. And especially if you have a problem with another race or religions right. in this lifetime, mm -hmm. guess what? You get to be next time. Yes, yes. And, and you and will be that race or that, that religion. That's the lesson that you got to learn. That is absolutely right. So, um, so I mean, when you know these things and you see the people playing, you know, uh, all the world's a stage and the men and women are merely players, people are just doing it unconsciously, right? Until they become conscious. And then when they're conscious, they start to realize, I mean, really, when you think about it, I mean, the color of the skin, people fighting over a color of a skin. Well, you know what? Um, you know, I, I was a hip, I was a practicing hypnotherapist for many years and I did regression, you know, age regression and uh, what they call past life or reincarnation. Right. And um, one of the things I had to tell is people, a lot of people come in there with certain expectations of who they were, right. which is, 
if you look at, you know, the idea of, you know, reincarnation, you, there's, you could have been various people, men, yes. you know, either sex, like right. you said, different. And as a matter of fact, and uh, one of the instructions that we said is like, well, let's, you know, we, and it's a process. Some people just suspend their disbelief because they want to overanalyze it. Right. Or their expectations. And they were surprised that a lot of people I had, they were actually shocked yes. to see who they were. I mean, really shocked. Right. right. Uh, and uh, contrary to what most people think, most people were nobodies. You know, you were. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you were not the queen or the princess or, That's right. uh, you know, anybody famous. That's very right. few. I don't think uh, everybody had a very, um, what's kind of, what's the word? ordinary, unknown, basically anonymous life. Yes. Uh, which in, in the point, I re- very rarely I could say that somebody had a life that they could research and say, hey, I can find out right. if that person really exists because. Yeah. Um, and sometimes they would say, well, well, why did I see that or what? I said, because there's something there about that lifetime that you needed to experience. There's something there that you needed to learn versus what you thought you were going to see because you have an affinity for whatever it is. And exactly like what you described, people would see themselves different, different sex, you know, male or female, you know, something they, they were uh, in a different place, they different races, different everything. And they would be like, I have never thought of this before. Like they had could, there was no affinity in other words, right. In their present right. life for what happened then. And I said, but on a soul level or on a subconscious level, yes. there was something there why you saw it. And, um, and one of the things I explained to them is I said, sometimes certain lifetimes you or experiences, you won't see them because you're not ready for it. Yes. Because sometimes things could have been horrific. Um, that's right. And you're not there. You're not ready for that. Maybe eventually mm-hmm. you will. You might have start be having very um, symbolic or colorful dreams, which is your mind trying to prep you for it. Yes. And sometimes some people never are. That's another thing. Sometimes people never are. But I totally agree with you where it's that quid pro quo. Yes, what right. you maybe lacked in understanding or compassion or empathy yes. or whatever. Yes. You can find yourself at the receiving end. And yes, the next full round. The, the real reason for us being here is to learn how to interact with each other, mm-hmm. learn how to love one another, learn how to get to this wonderful plateau of unconditional love and seeing all experiences in the one while we are all one and all are being one together, right? And so um, uh, it's it's fascinating uh, when when I when I meet people and uh, and uh, and it's funny because I I've been saying you think uh, when we're talking about extraterrestrial hybrids, for instance, mm-hmm. I said. Well, I'm a hybrid. I have everything in Europe in me. <laughs> and my Literally. pie chart says I do. <laughs> I am a, like a European mutt. Everything yes. on every yes. continent is in me, right? Uh-huh. And um, and I said someday, and and plus, there's so much extraterrestrial DNA from all of the the beings that have come and lived here from other worlds mm-hmm. over all the other years we we all basically are this extraterrestrial dna and and someday they're going to be able to fine tune that and you'll go to ancestry.com and they'll say well you're part syrian and uh you've got four percent pleiadian and <laughs> right right yeah about the strangest thing i got from mine was i was i'm three percent neanderthal you know because you know they proved that apparently that they did crossbreed between neanderthals and because of now you know the genetic stuff Yes. But uh, yes. whereas before they thought that they, they didn't overlap, that there was no interbreeding, that the Neanderthals died off. And it's like, what was it from that movie, Life Will Find a Way from Jurassic Park? Yes. Yeah, it. yeah, it does. It does. And, uh, totally and I'm going to ask you something about one of the most, I want to say, most familiar extraterrestrial that people see in the shows, which are those grays, the ones right. with the big eyes. So there, there are... 
there like like the human race mm -hmm. there are many versions many different species and races of grays right okay. so how in the book that i have categorized them is grays are negative but mm -hmm. then if there are some like the ones from zeta reticuli that are that are fully conscious and are really beautiful beings they prefer to be called zeta humans okay right so now there are so many different i mean i am not kidding you that uh, you, um you could write a whole book on all the different races but the ones that are that are doing the aggressive abductions and um uh what we call telepathic hypnosis mm -hmm. and things of that nature um i have heard in all cases that, that they do put uh, uh their victims in this telepathic hypnosis to bend them to their will there's only one case that I know of, and that's a Travis Walton case when he right. woke up on the ship mm -hmm. and he saw the two gray beings there. He literally flipped out and jumped off the table and grabbed something and was doing this. And they tried to telepathically hypnosis him and he fought it. He fought them in him trying to do that. Mm -hmm. And he fought it and they realized it was a losing battle. So they left the room. Okay. Right and that type of thing so um but the there there's many versions of of the story of the grays and i think it could be from many different races and things of that nature but um they uh, supposedly had gone uh for years and years and years they started losing their reproductive abilities because they they were they were losing their spiritual sense okay. and they were going into more science mm -hmm. and so they started cloning themselves and after years and years of cloning they were realizing that they they no longer had a sense of that their race was going to die out so what they wanted to do was was use our dna because okay. our dna is like royalty okay. to honestly to the rest of the universe because we have the ascension matrix in our dna okay which means we become fully conscious and we ascend to the next realm and so they don't have that and they wanted that as well so so then so then they would kidnap and abduct um people and that was part of supposedly their um their contract with the government that okay. they could abduct people at will just to examine them was what they said <laughs> okay and and that they could have bases and they would give them you know technology mm -hmm. and supposedly way back when a lot of the technology started off with transistor technology Okay. And, you know, and has, uh, and has just gone on from there because we've taken leaps and bounds. If you think about the 50s to now and oh, yeah. short the, 70 the years, I mean, it's crazy. Um, and that's supposedly how, like, other civilizations that we've read about, like Atlantis, destroyed themselves because they obtained too much technology too fast. And, are, there, uh, are there any extraterrestrials that are biomechanical? Or are yes. they just... There. Yeah, there, there, there are um, EBs are sort of. Uh, they look like little greys, but they're mm -hmm. basically their innards are more plant based. Mm -hmm. They're they're uh, chlorophyll, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's thought that they're they're given consciousness, but it's also thought that their creators control them like with a mind matrix mm -hmm. right they can fly ships and they can do stuff and what a better way to go and do your dirty work on a planet you don't want to get caught on than to have these beings do it 
right? So, um, so there, there's, but there's so many different stories that that go around about all these different things that I'm talking about, and you know, we'd always have to just say, I'm sure there's a little bit of truth to all of them. We we don't really know, but the good news is, is when we all become fully conscious, we will know everything. <laughs> Right now, it's just fun trying to learn it all, right? <laughs> of course, of course. And I'm going to, I'm going to ask you the question that I've been waiting to ask you since you told me about it at the very beginning, yeah. prior to us going live, which was, you have a story to tell about your biological father. Yes, and I I'm will. waiting to hear this with bated breath. Oh boy, it's a good one. So, mm-hmm. when I was 12 years old, my mom told me that my dad was my stepdad. That they got married when I was one years old, and um, I never looked at him as anything but my dad. So it didn't phase me in the least because he's just always been my dad. So um, I've lost both my parents. And all I, all my mom knew was my biological father's name. They had dated for a while. She became pregnant and um, she found out that he was married with a kid. Okay. And so she ended it. Um, and uh, so, so I really never knew him. She brought me up, her and my aunt, like the first year. And okay. um, we all lived in an apartment together. And uh, anyway, um, so I tried to find him throughout the years when the internet came up, but there were mm-hmm. na- his name was out there, but it wasn't him. And mm-hmm. I knew that he was in the military, but I didn't know what branch. I didn't know anything. And so long story short, I get this book deal to write the extraterrestrial species almanac. I start writing it in 2019. Mm -hmm. I get a phone call from a woman in Canada who tells me she's my fourth or fifth cousin. She's a real genealogist. And she was looking for some info on my mother's father, Earl. And I said, I said, great. Let me, let me give it to you. And I said, Hey, by the way, can you, help me find my biological father. She goes, Oh, I can find anybody. So I love it. I I gave her the name and what information I knew. So uh, about six months later, she sent me an email she goes, okay, I found him. He passed away in 2006 and he is buried here. And I said, great. I'm going down to the cemetery tomorrow. So I went down there and I said, when his body was brought in, can you tell me who called you guys? Is there a number, a name and a number in your files? So they went in the computer and they said, actually, we do have a name. It was a different last name than his. And, uh, but we don't have a phone number. So I said, no, that's great. So I went and visited his crypt and, um, and then I came home. I looked the man up lives around the corner from me, literally. And Ooh. so uh, all I could get was his home address. So okay. I wrote him a letter, told him my story, put my picture in there, said, if you know anybody in Fred's family, can you forward this on to them? So two days, I mail it on a Friday. I get a call on Monday. So like two, three days later, right? Two business days. And um, uh, the guy says, my father got your letter and, um, and I was just calling you and I said, Oh, was your father a friend of, uh, Fred's? And he said, no, it's actually his half brother. And I said, Oh, you're kidding. I said, so you're my cousin. And he goes, yeah, I guess I am. He goes, it's just really weird. You look just like him. And I said, well, I don't know. I've never seen a picture of him. So we ended up going to dinner like three long hours, and it seemed like a blink. And they, I just said, just tell me everything about him, right? And so my uncle is saying um, about an hour in, he said, so he really wanted to go into the air guard, but he was underage. And so he begged our mom, they had the same mom, different dads, mm-hmm. to um, 
uh, she had to sign a letter to let him go into the Air Guard. And so she did. And when he was 18, he went into the Air Force. And then he said, oh, and by the way, he worked in that Project Blue Book. What? That's just what I did. Just what you did is just what I did. <laughs> That's incredible. Is that incredible? Because that is incredible. Here, here I am writing right a book for MUFON. Uh -huh. Like so so um uh Blue Book was the US Air Force study on UFOs started in fifty two, was decommissioned in January of nineteen seventy, and they investigated over eleven thousand sightings. Its main study was to determine if UFOs were a threat to national security and to scientifically analyze UFO related data. Now here I am finding him finally when I'm writing this book. What are the chances? For MUFON books, I think it's uh -huh. And MUFON is the US based nonprofit comprised of civilian volunteers who study reported UFO sightings, right? Nice. So I'm thinking to myself, wow, this is this is just like it's in the DNA. Mm -hmm. So then, so then my uncle says, um, so you know, after a while, he realized he didn't, he was not going to go far in a military career, and mm -hmm. he came back to Los Angeles. That's when he met my mom, and then then he uh, got into the uh, one of the unions uh, for builders in the film industry. And he became the head of construction at Warner Brothers. He built sets for movies and TV. I cast movies and I was film about and to TV. say, is there any chance that you could have crossed paths with him unknowingly? I think so. I I have one I see one scenario in my head. Mm -hmm. Like around the corner from me is one of those old antique malls. Okay. And I would go in it with my mom from time to time and and then over the years and where I've lived out here, I've lived out here since 1990. So I've been out here a long time. And my bio father and his wife had a booth in this antique mall. You were so close. And I keep having this vision that when I was in there that I saw him standing there and I sort of looked and smiled. And that was it, right? Not knowing. And I and that's just what's in my head. I don't know if it's mm -hmm. true or not, but um, you know. So and the, and he lived out here where I live with his wife uh, until she passed away of cancer, and um, you know that kind of thing. So uh, so I just think that story is just so fascinating. I think considering that you were basically living parallel lives, but yeah. at the same time. There was nothing that you knew about each other. Well, you about him, especially about what he'd been doing. Right, right. Even but, before your conception, which is wow. Yeah, yeah. And I and uh, I think a lot of, you know, I myself, as you know, being, you know, when you're empathic and, and you mm -hmm. become psychic, uh, and especially when you're doing this work, you really do. It really heightens. And um, it's like I had to... I had to be born, right? Mm -hmm. yes. So, so, uh, and I wanted her to be the vehicle, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so you know, he got to be the donor. <laughs> well, you know what? Sometimes, you know how they say that that the you know that you, you know, you choose your circumstances, your parents, yes, absolutely. whatever, you know, before that you decide this is where I'm going to be conceived into between these people. And, and sometimes, yes, it, you know, you do, supposedly you do make a choice. Of course you don't remember it. Right. There is a reason that you're on a soul level, at least yes. why you choose what you choose. That's right. That's right. So anyway, it's just, it was just such a fascinating, I think that and is and now I've got you know, lots, and lots of pictures that my uncle shared with me. I found a whole, side of my family that I didn't know. And I was uh, going to ask you, did you now, have you met other, 
uh, family members from your dad? Yeah, yeah, I've met, uh, well, my cousin, and then my uncle has three sons. Um, I've talked to one of his sons mm -hmm. um, who doesn't live here. Um, okay. And I actually, through my biological father, he had a daughter who was four years older than me. Mm -hmm. um, but everyone thinks that she passed away at some point. So oh, they've lost no, no, nobody. Yeah. And the genealogist cannot find the trail of what happened to her or the ex-wife. We can't find any death records or okay. anything of that nature. So, um, and then I have a stepbrother and uh, two stepsisters, which is really awesome. And uh, so they all flew out, came out here and met me in uh, Christmas of 2019 before the craziness started happening. Right, right. When you were people allowed to like go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some places, so, in other words. Yeah, it was just very exciting. So that is great. That is such a fantastic story. Yeah, isn't you know, it? It's right? like, um, it's almost like, a, and it's almost like you think, okay, it's like, Everything's going to, in other words, everything becomes clear. But after, from what you've told me, your mom had passed away already. Everybody yeah. had passed away. Yeah. And, um, wow. Yeah, so all three of them are on the other side. Yeah, they must have been yeah. saying, look, they, yeah, it makes me yeah. wonder, you know, they're looking on going, oh, okay, this is great. Yeah, oh, I feel them around all the time. So, and my thing? mom is very smart. She's she's appeared to me mm -hmm. um, here. Um, I can hear her audibly. Okay. And I've even captured her in a 3D image. Because, you know, when you go to the other side, you go back to looking like you're 25 to 30. Your best moment. Yeah, your best moment. And I actually have a picture of uh, a lot of her pictures in her best moments. Mm -hmm. and, um, and this is like this 3D where she's sort of turning Mm -hmm. And it's just her head over my head. Wow. That's it is incredible. Most, it, yeah, I have shown it to a lot of paranormal. They said this is one of the best spirit photos we've ever seen. That is so, excellent. Yeah, so yeah. it's really, um, you know, really, really amazing. I think that is, that, that story that you told was, um, you know, because sometimes people look, you know, at the drama. In other words, what was actually happening. And then right. as the years go by, it, everything comes down. And at this point, yes. like I said, everybody that maybe was emotionally, you know, caught up is yeah. dead. So it's like, okay, th th there's still happy ending. Always, always happy endings. Yeah. Always happy endings. I love that. Always, right. always happy endings. And endings. it's, and it's, and I can't get over that thing that he was in, in, involved in what he was involved in. I know. And here you are. Makes you wonder what was there something there that um, that you were pulled into it? Maybe as a child, what you're saying is that there was already something, even genetically, a predisposition. Right. You. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I as I tell everyone, you know, when people don't believe in um, extraterrestrials or or angelics or anything mm -hmm. like that. I, I usually say to them, well, where do you think your soul is from? Okay. And I start with that. And usually they don't know how to answer that. And I said, well, do you think you're an earth soul or do you think you came from somewhere else? Right. And then if you want to quote some things that Jesus said, he said, my father had many mansions Mm -hmm. And he talked about not being from here. Exactly. Right. There's so, a so there's it, a lot of references in the Bibles also, and you know, to uh, no. extraterrestrial, depending on how you, you know, extraterrestrial contact. Well, if you look through all of the ancient history, mm -hmm. you see, um, you see flying saucers in uh, Vatican art, you mm -hmm. see it in Egyptian hieroglyphs, you see serpent beings, you see the greys, which were probably the good greys because they mm -hmm. were interacting with Aztecs and they were interacting with Egyptian. And um, 
interestingly enough, in the in this book, um, it's actually already going into its third printing wow. in uh, this month. And so what I did was, is I combined and rewrote the chapters on Agartha and Telos, because Telos is uh, the Lemurians that live uh, beneath Mount Shasta. So I combined those and I added uh, another race in the book. But in Agartha, for instance, the Lemurians live, uh, they live in Telos, which is uh, below Mount Shasta. So that okay. is the Lemurian capital. Um, and then the Atlanteans capital is under the Mato Grasso in Brazil. And that's okay. theirs. And that's called Posid. And then the uh, whole Agarthan capital is Shambhala the Greater beneath Tibet. Now there are lots and lots of different uh, cities and things that are spread out through that network. Um, and uh, so there's a whole new plethora of information about Agartha and how the Agarthans live. Was uh, there any truth to the Atlantis, I want to say, myth that you hear about where it was, well, ancient Atlantis, where it was destroyed? And... Uh, well, I, I don't get into that. I just get into what they are now. Mm -hmm. But I, I do believe, and this is just my belief system from the research and things that I've done, is that, again, they got technology way too fast. And as we know, okay. even a fully conscious being... Mm -hmm. who is in full divine power, even a created being, which is like a god or a goddess, right? Okay. They can even be swayed. Okay, yes. You see? So. so the ego can take over and they can slowly degenerate. So mm -hmm. so I believe this is what is what happened there. And I, I think a lot of the fully conscious beings knew that this was happening. So a lot of them started leaving the planet and the rest went below and started uh, living underground. Now, it is also said that all the planets are made hollow for, uh, for the beings to live on the interior of the planet. Because if you really think about it, living on the exterior, you were bombarded with uh, all the things in the universe, right. you you are subject to the rays that age you, mm -hmm. you are subject to all of that. So in these um, extraterrestrial communities uh, on craft and in, in the interior worlds, they are able to keep a resonation field that keeps their cells alive. These are what a lot of the early beings like Valiant Thor, um, the being that visited George Van Tassel and also George Adamski were all coming to share how to do cell rejuvenation to keep yourself mm -hmm. healthy and young, right? That's why exactly. the Integratron was built out in Yucca Valley. That's wow. why George Van Tassel built that. I mean, um, and that's Integratron.com in case anybody wants to look okay. it up. It's a fascinating, fascinating building. Um, they give sound baths out there. If you ever get to experience one of those, mm -hmm. you will be in living nirvana. I'm not kidding. Wow. You. Yeah. What are the, and, and as a matter of fact, I even read a story like back in the 1930s that had somebody, I can't remember the gentleman's name right now, um, going under LA looking for, he said was an underground ancient city and that there were also reptilian type people. Um, yes. yes. I don't know if you've heard of that. There, there are, and there are, there are also good and bad races uh, mm -hmm. below as well. And they have their own little sections. Uh, and by the way, you know, all reptilians are not bad. There's, there's, okay. a, I think a race called the SARS, S A U R S, that mm -hmm. are, they, they basically, um, are the same height as Earth people. Okay. And, uh, they're primarily, uh, brown and green and that kind of thing. There's a few that every once in a while I get a little color in them from what I've mm -hmm. been told. And, um, and that they actually do have really good senses of humor like humans do. 
Okay. So, so you have to remember that just like humans, there's good and bad in right. us and in every race, there's good and bad. So they always want everyone to remember, judge the individual, not the race. Right. And, you know, I know we, we and I'm going to, I'm going to blame Hollywood for this. You either get the, their, you know, ET phone home, it's all wonderful or, the uh, Independence Day, which is like they're coming for you, you know right. that, that middle of the road you don't, you never see. It. I guess it's not that the drama's not that great when you look at it yeah, from that point of yeah. view. Exactly, exactly. You know? Yeah. So, <laughs> so from what you're saying is we all got uh, we we all have some type of uh, we, they they tweaked us genetically. We do have DNA then from uh, yes, these beings. yeah, we do. And, and hybrids here, I, I've met many hybrids who our actual have extraterrestrial DNA from up there. So what's mm -hmm. stronger is that it is, uh, it is usually injected by the extraterrestrials when uh, the embryo and the sperm have already connected okay. and they, they put it in there. They, they, they have technologies um, where they can siphon out things. So if they wanted this being to be a little smarter for what their mission on earth mm -hmm. is, they can they can inject that they can inject uh, anything that would be due. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, father worked for the military, and she was one of the military experiments with six six different kinds of extraterrestrial DNA. Wow. And um, she and she actually also had reptilian DNA, okay. and so she looked a little different, and her fingers were a little different. And she was the most loving person on the face of the planet that you would so ever meet. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and I've just you know I've met lots of others as well. So um, and by the way, uh, I'm making the extraterrestrial species almanac into a documentary right now, and I am bringing on a lot of these hybrids to oh. talk. Okay, that's going to be so fascinating. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. When totally. are you going to have that for this year or not till next year? Well, probably won't be up till next year because mm -hmm. uh, yeah, unless we really, you know, hone it in, but I would say next year. Fantastic. Greg, yeah. thank you so much. It has been, it's been fascinating to speak to you because um, I think a lot of people, whereas before I want to say in prior decades, you know, it was uh, extraterrestrials were like a sci-fi thing. Right. And right. They yes. were like, Yeah. But now yeah. I think more and more people are, if they don't, if they haven't had a firsthand experience, they're open to the belief that there are other life forms and that they're here. That there are, and and just let me throw this out really quick. Mm -hmm. Mo all of the research I did, a lot of the races in the book are from actual contactee cases. Yes. And I obtained permission from either the publishers or the actual contactees to put their their the information in the book and okay. even one one man who is in uh, who uh, is in contact face to face contact with the clarions allowed me to put a picture of a male and female clarion in the book. Oh, excellent. Yeah. That so, is fantastic. Yeah. I think that is uh, and and you said that uh, they can either go to Amazon or yeah, to your website. Can. Yeah, they can go to Amazon, or uh, if they want to get uh, personalized and autographed copies from me, they can go to Autobiography mm -hmm. of an A N E T dot com, and my book series is on the front homepage, and then in okay. the tab, if you click Other Books, that will um, take you to the Extraterrestrial Species Almanac and a few other books and things that I have there as well. And then Stranger at the Pentagon, if you want to see the short film. Or mm -hmm. I also have all of Dr. Frank's out-of-print books on the website as well. Okay. Um, you can see the short film there. Or if you have Amazon Prime uh, in America and the UK, you can watch it on Amazon Prime. So if they want an autograph, though, they have to go to your site. Yes. Yes, for okay. sure. And I personalize it as well. Excellent. So, Again, yeah. thank you so much. It has been wonderful. And I want to wish you the best of luck in all your projects. 
Oh, thank, thank you, you so much. I had so much fun being with you today. It was great. It was great. I, I love this. I love this subject. You have no idea. Again, I know. It's so much fun. Well, we'll do it again. Yes, we must. We must most definitely. And that, that thing that you told me about your dad, that was the best. I, I can't get it's over that. Best. I know. I know. It is. Yep. <laughs> Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Wow. I think that um, this is the kind of thing I love to hear that story that he said about his dad, because, you know, there's always people that will say, well, you know, people are, if not consciously, subconsciously, they're steered in a certain direction or choices because, um, you know, they they, they, they're not aware of it, but they are. There's there's subconscious pressures or things, and that's how they end up doing this, even though they might swear up and down that, hey, that was purely coincidental. But when you have something like what he described with his dad, where he had no contact, he had no idea whatsoever about what his dad had done in life, where he had been, none of that. And just about the time that he's, uh, of all the times, in other words, that he could have come across and found his father. He, that could have happened. But it, that call that he gets from a genealogist that turns around and helps him locate his father also coincides with the time that he's writing a book about extraterrestrials. And then he finds out what his dad was involved in. And also that his dad um, worked, I want to say, in the same industry as what he's done. That's incredible. That is really incredible. Um, and again, you know, because we've talked about it in other shows where, you know, you have the one school of thought, which is like Stephen Hawking's like, we got to be careful with extraterrestrials because technologically we are at a disadvantage, which means that if they turn out not to be so nice, we're, for lack of a better word, we're screwed. Uh and then you get the other ones, which is tra-la-la, like E.T. phone home. It's so sweet. It's so nice. They would never, ever, ever do things. And then, of course, you you know, you get all these other programs where you uh, see cattle mutilations. Um, again, uh, the abduction, what he was, uh, Travis, that gentleman that he talked about, I'm sure you've seen it. That's a very famous and well-documented abduction uh, where he, of his, you know, him of, I think it was five of them. I want to say, and he was the one that was abducted and he disappeared for a week. And uh, authorities even thought that his friends had done away with him. And, um, you know, you hear those stories, which makes you think, well, obviously they didn't kill him and they returned him. But in other words, the impression you get is that they saw this human being as exactly like what we do when we um, we get an animal and we want to tag it, you know, and we keep it to study it, and then we release it. In other words, there's a there's a superiority kind of angle to this. Like, yeah, I'm not gonna hurt you, but I'm gonna do this and this and that to you. But this is for your own good. We I, I, we need to study you, and you know that's almost the feeling that you get, which is well, it's not the these extraterrestrials are necessarily evil in that sense of the word evil, but that they see us as beneath them, just sometimes the way we see animals uh, that we're superior. And even if we're trying to help them, it's okay to take them out of their environment and tag them and do this to that and that to this, and, you know, et cetera. And there's a lot of people, myself included, which is where are we in all of this or where, you know, are we either going to be at their mercy? Are we on the same level? Do they want to help us? Um, or are they, you know, like that uh, Star Trek thing, the prime directive where they don't interfere. They're going to stand back and let us either make it or crash and burn. Um, and, it, and, and I think that a lot of what Craig was talking about in his books is that there's several different species. Uh, some better than others as far as we're concerned. And I think it's 
I thought it was really interesting when he mentioned that there's um, a universal law that they must all adhere to, whether they like it or not. How's that? That in other words, that if like he was saying, well, if this is, uh, if let's say somebody's doing this and they're not supposed to, unless they step over the line and, and allow us to, we, we, to interfere, we cannot do anything except stand back and just cross our fingers. That's that's a very interesting, and it, and it makes you wonder, like, how far reaching are these set of rules or laws or whatever you call them? Do they all adhere to it? And who started it, or where was the origin of this? Uh, and again, I, I mean, I have so many people that I'm 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 only hoping that in my lifetime that we're going to have a true. Oh, what's the, the, the admission or proof or whatever about extraterrestrials that we see, whatever it is, you know, that there is a variety of them, that some are friendly, some are not, and some are like in the middle, indifferent kind of. Uh, because sometimes, you know, you see that now the government will kind of admit maybe, and even then they'll say, well, UFOs are just unidentified flying objects. We're not saying they're extraterrestrial. We're just saying that these flying, whatever they are, we just can't explain them. And that's about as much as you so far that you're going to get officially. And I'm wondering, and I, and I guess that's what I was trying to, to ask Craig. Are we ever going to have the authorities when I say authorities, I mean government, whether it's the United States or any other country, ever come out and actually say, okay, this is the official version. There are extraterrestrials and blah, 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 blah. Or, or are the extraterrestrials going to do something like land on the front lawn of the White House? You know, something that they, you can't hide this. You can't... Um, Dismiss it. You can't, you know, cover it up with a lot of the stories that sometimes you've heard through the years about different, uh, you know, UFO sightings or anything like that, where basically the ETs say, that's it. Uh, we're going to let the cat out of the bag. Here it is. And then, you know, we've talked about, I've talked about this on other shows. How would people handle it? Part of me says, that because we've already been conditioned partially to it because through years of movies and, you know, moving away from the flying saucer Martian guys with the ray guns coming to get us. And part of us, I think, are pretty much okay with thinking, okay, but like I said, there's a big difference between seeing documentaries on the Discovery Channel or like ancient aliens or all these different shows about extraterrestrials and have they been around and have they uh, basically interfered with humanity? It's almost like theory and practice. How many people that are saying, wow, that's really cool. And I'm going to go and see if I can spot a UFO to the point where all of a sudden it's off the table as far as this is not a theory anymore. This is the reality. Yes, there's not only one extraterrestrial, there's several of them. That's, that's, I mean, let's just go really deep down the rabbit hole. And some are not, I mean, I think there's a lot of people that think their heads would explode. Literally and figuratively, you know, because this, I'm telling you, there's a lot of people that it's almost like, it's fun while it's a theory. And it's great storytelling. But the actual reality, if it ever was truly confirmed through some way or shape, whatever, a lot of people would lose it. It would really take them. I, I could see where a lot of people, this would not fit in well. Because let's face it, most people as human beings live in this world where because of our intelligence, we are at the top of the food chain in this world. And if we ever had to face the reality that there are extraterrestrial beings that 
well, it sounds like technologically, at the very least, they're superior to us. We would be knocked off our perch like very quickly, very quickly. There's a lot of people that this would be like. So how do I how do I live my life from now on? I I mean I could see people just like just having a little meltdown. It's like, okay, so you know this square little way that I live my life now what? Do I keep on paying my taxes? Do I keep on paying my mortgage? Do I keep on paying my car note? Who cares? There's there's extraterrestrials among us. That I, I think about the only thing that would soothe it. I want to say um, that anxiety or the you know what what's going to happen? How do we live life now when we realize that uh, we're not the the kings of the you know the king of the hill kind of, kind of stuff? Is that they could show that they have lived among us, number one for many years. Okay, and number two, um, proof, and I don't know how this would go, of hybrids. In other words, humans that are have um, some type of DNA, and they're fine, they're okay, they're like us. But I, I imagine something like that, that kind of proof, it would take a while to manufacture it. But, um, yeah, it would... It makes you wonder if that's really what they've been holding off on. That it's not just the vibrational state of some humans that haven't attained it. It's just that a lot of us would lose our, you know what, uh, because we would have a hard time dealing with that reality. And a lot of people are saying, no, that would be so cool. That would be so great. I'm telling you, a lot of people, if that ever, ever truly came, and was admitted to proof positive, not theory, not suspicion, not, you know, something you see on the TV and you get experts that say, well, this is not, this is would be an undeniable proof there in your face. There's a lot of people that would not be, know how to handle it. I'm not going to tell you they would not know how to handle it forever and ever, but that would cause, I mean, talk about the different things that could have, of, of, you know how everybody talks about things like in the economy, things that would affect us worldwide, that I think would be the one that would be at the top as far as making everything in this world, every country, every government, everybody just like talk about taking a pause. And I'll tell you that much, we'd all be then, then we'd really stick together <laughs> because it'd be like us humans, you know, forget, there's we're not different. We're all like humans because all of a sudden it's that, because whichever way you want to look at it, these extraterrestrials, we were, many of them would look at them as non-humans. Interesting. Yeah, that, that would just open up a whole can of worms as how we see ourselves and what our place in the world is and in the universe. God, that's a whole other show. So again, guys, I hope you like, I hope you like this show with Craig. I thought it was fascinating. Um, I'm going to have a link to his website on the credits of the show and, uh, for those of you who are listening to the podcast, uh, if you, you know, he's on Amazon and audiobook, but if you want to get an autographed uh, book, you have to go to autobiography, autobiography of net.com and then forward slash books or autobiography of net, O F A N E T.com. Uh, you could go there. That's his main page. And there you could. And also, which I thought was really interesting, which is uh, if you want to see that film that he talked about. All right. Uh, Stranger at the Pentagon. That's where you could go to see it. And also, I'm sure maybe that he will be posting uh, anything having to do with his projects uh, about what he's going to be working on that he says is going to be out for next year, 2022. So, again, guys, thank you for being part of my audience. You're all wonderful. Don't forget to send me your stories. Please like and subscribe to us wherever you find us so that you get notified when I release a show. Um, again, uh, this is the, you know, you can also, um, if you go to the home systems like Alexa or Sonos, you can either look us up as Supernatural, Stories of the Supernatural for this show, Nightshade Diary, 
or Supernatural Storytime. I've got three separate uh, podcast series that you can find. And of course, you can go to Amazon.com and look up my author book as Marlene Pardo Pellis, and you're going to see all my books, which, like I said, the last no, the one I'm presently working on is the Film Noir Murders number two, which are a series of true crimes um, dating between the 20s, 1920s into the 1950s, that era of um, which a lot of people think of the good old days. And in some respects, they were. But then a lot of things, you know, like I said, sometimes we look at these um, true crime shows uh, that were maybe we'll look at, you know, recent crimes, maybe into the 90s or newer. And you're like, wow, that's a lot of, you know, that was really horrific. Let me tell you something. You'd be surprised some of the things, uh, murders that were being committed back in those days that, wow. Uh, despite even the ones that are well publicized, like the torso murders and the Belisca Axe murder, that you think, wow, there was a lot of um, murders that took place that never received that uh, notoriety. But obviously they were committed by disturbed people, very disturbed. And and, and not all of them were ever uh, solved. They were never solved. Of course, you know, back then they had no forensics and things of that nature. But uh, yeah, yeah, we've been uh, doing stupid stuff like killing each other for, you know, yeah, those those uh, people have been out there, sociopaths and psychopaths. They've been among us all along. So yeah, that's the book I'm working on and I'll let you guys know when I'm ready to release it. It's going to be this year though. It's going to be this year. And then later on, I'll be working on the third book in the Sybil universe. And again, I'll let you guys know about that. So don't forget, if you got stories, contact me at marlene at mymikoschronicles.com. Till then, see you next week, guys. Take care. <laughs>